Hello, everyone out there in podcast world. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, you're listening to or watching live uh, the uh, Service Business Mastery Podcast. I'm honored to be here with uh, Mr. Ken Goodrench and Billy Stevens. Uh, Billy's been on the show a lot, and every time we have Billy on the show, the feedback that at least I get, I know Josh gets a little bit too, uh, is that it's a ton of knowledge and it's very relevant information, uh, and which is always appreciated. And and I know every time I talk to, to Ken and, and see anything that Ken puts out there, it's, it's it's the same way. So I'm super excited to have both of you guys on the show today. Thanks for having us. It's good to be here. Yeah. So um, I guess, Josh, do you want to say anything before I? No. You're good. Really? <laughs> Seriously? I, I said everything I need to say <laughs> last night. <laughs> so, Ken, for, I, and I know you've been on a lot of these different shows and stuff like that. And could you tell us? For people that don't know your story, because yeah, Billy shared his story on our show, and, and you know when you guys started out doing this, there was there wasn't a blueprint, there was none yeah. of this stuff that is available today, where it's like a quick like, hey, follow this game plan, you can get to this X Y Z number. Could you tell us just a little bit about your your, your backstory and how you, how it got in here? I know thirty years and condensing that's tough, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Also, can you share about Ghetto and like how? how that came about for those who don't know. Okay. Well, I think, you know, I think I started like lots of guys in our industry, you know, holding the flashlight for my dad. Started about 10 years old, uh, based in Las Vegas. And my dad would moonlight fixing air conditioners. Eventually he became a contractor and, you know, I was enslaved to the family business, uh, working nights and weekends and every summer. And, uh, side by side with my dad and I learned the trade, got to the place even before I could drive where I could diagnose, diagnose an air conditioning system, change the compressor and all that kind of stuff. And then back, you know, maybe when I was in my, um, you know, 15, 16, my dad came to the office one day and he showed us our new brand, which was Gettle. He became a Gettle dealer. Okay. So Gettle started in um, 1939 in Phoenix. And uh, they were manufacturers, actually, and they manufactured. First, they, they took the evaporative cooling business and uh, started to mass produce them. They were kind of a you know, one-off when they first got there in the late 30s. They started mass producing evaporative coolers, and then they eventually took Lewis Carrier's invention of the refrigerate, refrigeration and applied it to a package unit. Uh where they could replace the swamp cooler and put it on the roof in Phoenix, Arizona. They really attributed uh, with the invention of the residential air conditioner. Well, that really stopped, that started the population growth of Phoenix. Right. Phoenix was pretty uninhabitable before that because it's how hot. I know you shared that story. It was a pretty interesting read. Yeah, at one point, they, they called it air cooling. And at one point, uh, the Gettle brothers were kind of the pioneers, the Steve Jobs of air cooling, and oh, yeah. Phoenix, Arizona was kind of the uh, Silicon Valley of air cooling. That's wow. where it all kind of got started. Now, are you still industry. doing that? Do you still have any of the manufacturing? Aspect? No, they, they stopped manufacturing in 07. But okay. go back to my story. So here I am, a kid, and my dad says, this is the best air conditioner ever made and the best brand. And they really were very robust because they were designed at 115 degree ambient. Hmm. Uh, temperature, whereas most air conditioners designed at 95 degrees. Yeah. So they were just really built hardy for the severe climate. And so they had a big meaningful presence in the Southwest. And then they got a hold of Dell Webb and traveled to their uh, retirement communities. So in Florida, Texas, California, and Arizona, there's a lot of kettles. A lot of guys contact me from those markets and send me pictures of old kettles. But we, the machine was so robust that we're pulling 50-year-old gettles off roofs in Phoenix today that are still running. Wow. So when it, going into the service company, is that where, because you guys' tagline is, we do things the right way. Is it, is it, we do things the right way, not, not the easy way. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that kind of born from the manufacturer side and carry that over? How did that come about? You know, that's, that was something my dad used to tell me. So let's go back to the dad's story. We become ghetto dealers, and you know, I'm going to sales calls with my dad, and he's telling 
everybody why it's the best piece of equipment and why he wished everything was manufactured this way and it gets ingrained in my head and then he passed away when i was 25 and i bought the family business for my mom and i had my struggles there trying to figure out business and gettle was the only company that would give me credit really <laughs> probably because i had a mullet <laughs> we've all seen that yeah. but you know uh you know, they were the only ones who kind of helped me get off the ground in business. And so I sold Gettles as one of our primary offerings up until 2007 when they stopped making them. So I started in 86, and through 2007, I was still a Gettle dealer. And then, you know, one thing led to another, and, you know, Gettle kind of fell on some hard times. And um, I kind of felt like it was my destiny to save it, you know, because, yeah. you know, with my father and Gettle and everything that we had built over the years, they were right there in the, found, uh, the foundation of it all. Not to mention, I was really intrigued by the fact that I could own the brand that invented the air conditioner. I thought that was a good, yeah. from a marketing guy standpoint, it's not bad, right? <laughs> That's pretty good. Right. That's excellent. I, I think the maybe the challenge would be the spelling and pronunciation, but y'all, well, I feel like y'all have done a great job with that. But a guy from the East Coast that's never seen it, and then to see it come on social media and everything, uh, I, I had my challenges, you know, to start with. But then, you know, it, I feel like once I seen the advertisement and everything, it was obviously easier to. Yeah, I got to do that challenge. Sorry about that. Yeah. So when, when I, you know, the first air conditioner I ever lit up with my flash, flashlight as a kid was a Gettle, and it had this cool little diamond badge. I said to my dad, what is that word? He said, you're going to have to figure that on your own. <laughs> I had one of those dads. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I finally figured it out. But when I when I got the company, I, I went to Roy Williams, the Wizard of Ads, right, mm -hmm. and, and have him to help me with the brand. And I said, look, the number one thing we have to do is be able to uh, – be able to uh, tell the consumer how to say our name, you know, because it's always been a challenge since I was 10 years old. Right. And no one can pronounce it right. And he goes, he looks at me for a minute, he goes, G-O-E-T-T-L, it'll keep you cool, but it's hard to spell. <laughs> that's pretty good. Like, yeah. that was that quick. And that's why he's the that's wizard. Why he's a pro. That's why he's the wizard. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, we grab that and we say that on most of our advertising and sort of mass media. And for some reason, that statement just sticks in people's head and they love that statement because it's not really talking about air conditioning or that we're honest or 24 7 service. It's, right. it's something a little quirky. And something about that really stuck in people's heads. Yeah. yeah. No, so what 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 I thought could be a huge potential negative to the brand, we've really turned into a positive. That's that's really saying something, uh, and saying something to the marketing side, and knowing that you have an issue, a potential issue, and and facing it head on instead of trying to, you know, rebrand to avoid it. Or um, I mean, it's easy to it's easy to fall into that trap where you're like, all right, I'm going to change this, change the name, change all these other things. But instead you figured out a way to just make it happen and make it so that it's a more memorable name. So like now it's there forever. I'm very proud about the fact that, you know, where I started and now I've come completely full circle to own the brand that we started with. Yeah. And I was able to resurrect that brand. And you know, so, you know, it means a lot to me, the brand. And, you know, the, the technology that they put into the industry and what they've done for this industry and mankind, really. Um, so I said, okay, well, what's my mission here? And I thought, well, I just, I want to see the brand perpetuate itself and, you know, be an enduring, great company. So... We came up with the vision of ghettoize the nation. And that was kind of the battle cry for the team because I want to build a business. Well, we're building a business whereby, and I tell every technician we have, you can be the CEO of this company one day. It's not a mom and pop operation. It's not closely held. You know, my dream is to have it to be a nationwide business where everybody has an opportunity to start from the field like I did 
and work their way up into different roles and positions and new experiences and have an opportunity to be whoever they want to be inside that business that, like I said, revolutionized an industry. Yeah. So you guys have, you guys have obviously been making a lot of acquisitions. And I had this question I posted um, on social media, like, what, what would people want to hear about? Uh, as far as questions and stuff like that, because a lot of people are they're thinking about selling, or they're, they even if they don't want to sell, they want to get ready just in case that day. Ever I mean, comes. it's it's what we all are talking about. I mean, for the past couple of years, like there's not a week that you can get two times EBITDA, three times EBITDA, four times EBITDA, and then like, oh, that's unheard of. You're not going to get any higher than that. And it's like ten times EBITDA, twelve times EBITDA. Like all of a sudden, things that you've worked. I don't know, three, four years ago, we had people on the show, brokers, that um, they were like, you're not going to get any better than that. Like, the, like you're a good company and you'll get X, Y, and Z. And now those numbers are being, those records are being broken. And so even somebody that wasn't considering selling, they're like, hmm, maybe, maybe now is the time to, to do something like that. Uh, but as for a buyer goes, when you're hearing these really high numbers, like as a as a seller, you're hearing these high numbers constantly. How do you? I guess how do you have that conversation, or do you have that conversation with someone and say, "Hey, look, like those numbers were for companies that were very, you know, had process and procedures in place. They had the things that we liked in place, so we were willing to pay that amount." On your company, we're not really, you know, this is where you're at. Do you do you go into having that conversation, or do you just like? let a broker handle all of that. I've been doing acquisitions since I was, you know, 26, 27 years old. So it's, it's my game. And the way I look at it is it's a market, right? So the, the multiples up, go up, the multiples go down. Mm-hmm. And um, um, I, I got to a place where I wasn't really an HVAC contractor. I was a business builder. I'd buy underperforming or less expensive companies, and I would, I would, uh, you know, improve their process and their culture and their teams and such, and grow them. And I would sell them. So you know, a four multiple, you know, I might have bought it for the equivalent of a one multiple, mm-hmm. and then I grew it. And then when I exited with the four multiple, it was more like a 40 multiple yeah. for more my initial investment. So I don't get too hung up on that. It's really, it really depends on how much you got invested in the thing, right? Um, and there's all kinds of ways that you go around and, and value them. I know right today, I said this the other day, I talked to a competitor a competitor in the, in the, they don't call it a roll up anymore, they call it a build up, right? In the build up space. And uh, I'm like, why'd you buy that? And he goes, buy them for 10, sell them for 20. I'm like, you still got to run the fuckers. Right? <laughs> right. They, got, they got to work, it's, right? It's you know, gotta be yeah, like, I can't tell you how many times I've watched others or I've bought a business and they kind of unravel sometimes. I mean, it's not a foregone conclusion that you're going to, 10 extra money. It is yeah. Not, no. Well, that's the assumption that everybody's like, it, it's what's being sold on social media is that that's, that's the case. Yeah, I and, assure you it's not. I got my fires every day. Yeah. Right. And, and I'm, is that when you're taking your walks? Yeah. And I, and I'm, and I think I'm okay at it and I got my fires. So, but listen, here's what you don't understand. Billy started this whole recent game. He's ground zero. Yeah. That's what I was getting ready to say. I mean, we have the guy that's this, really started all of this. He's the real innovator here. Yeah. I still remember, so we, we, we were, we were going to first interview you, Billy. You got sick. Yeah, I did. And I, I knew you were somebody. I didn't know who you were in the story. And I'm sitting here and we're talking and we just kept talking and talking. The very Even after I talked to Billy, I'm texting we him. Like, it was it was a long time ago now. Oh. But um, Billy's like, I'm not sure that I want to do that. I don't know that I want to get on it. I was like, I don't blame you because... If I was you, I wouldn't want to get out there and share all my stuff either because it's it's definitely you have so much knowledge in this space that uh, some people could, I guess, take advantage of you. Um, maybe uh, – is, is, that, is that the best way to say it? No, I mean, taking advantage of him. I do my best. <laughs> I, I do my That's absolute the Texan best. In him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
can you share a, about your experience with this building? I mean, we have we have other things that we want to go into, and we don't. Have, Obviously, we have yeah. Time, I mean, but. that was that was uh, twelve years ago now uh, when we first started talking about uh, rolling up companies or build up companies, if you will. And we didn't we didn't really have the game plan yet, but we knew that we could use leverage low interest rates in the SBA to go out and get these companies and pay them a decent multiple that wasn't unheard of back in the day, right? I mean, a 4X back then was like 100 times better than you could do because your only option back then was to sell it to your competitor, give it to your kids, or close it down when you die, right? Yeah. I mean, that was your options. And so we started uh, looking into this and we made our first big purchase down in Houston, Texas. It's about a, a $9 million uh, plumbing company down there. And, you know, bolted on air conditioning and then the thing grew up to be the largest company in Houston, Texas. And it just took, a, you know, you know, a year, two summers, wow. basically, to do this. And, and then we knew we were on to something. And so that's how I got started. That, that was really the whole game plan from there. And then the um, funny thing was, is a lot of other folks, you know, passed on the deal before me. <laughs> right. When I saw it, I saw the opportunity. I saw that this could work. And that's why I went ahead and went for it. And so that's how I ended up with Ground Zero. And some of those companies that passed ended up being in the wrench group anyway. So that's funny. Uh, they, they probably quickly realized their mistake. Yeah. Right, right. So, so how did that, that snowballed into like you leaving out of the wrench group and then you started uh, Sarah? I mean, it's not that simple of a process. I, mean, I simplified it a lot, but share that a little bit yeah so one of the things that happened when i met these guys is again they didn't know much about the industry and the industry wasn't making a lot of money back then and then when i talked to them and showed them my financials they they kind of went bonkers and like we got to do this and they're like the first question to me was can we replicate it and i said of course you can i know the formula i can get you there as quickly as we can as possible and so that was really what got them excited um, because even back then before we had any real technology our company was making about 25 cents on the dollar. And we weren't the largest company in town, but we had enough money to buy all the big guys in town. And that was the difference, is we created a lot of cash in the company. Um, kind of like a drug dealer is what they were saying. You're like, man, you make so you much money, you're sticking cash. it in the walls. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to hide it and bury it in places. And, and so that was kind of how it got started. And that's we just replicated that. And you know, we lowered the multiples, you know, the margins down. I mean, 24 was unsustainable without the technology that we had back then as we grew so we picked 18 yeah. uh, as our target and then which was generous yeah it was very generous um when the you know we're talking about negative zero oh yeah. I mean, for for the industry at the time it was just negative it was zero what's the what's the average now would you i mean do y'all know you know i don't think it's so much higher i think overall it's probably like six Six percent. I was going to say five, five, yeah. five or six percent. So even with all these shiny bells and whistles out there, it really hasn't improved, and that's really why. Some of those shiny bells and whistles. The reason why we don't. Know, maybe, maybe. maybe. We pay a lot for those well, things. We're so taking that shiny object. Do you feel like the companies like like yourself that are growing, acquiring because you have those systems now, then with the software, you're able to take a company that's say a five percent net and easily get your money back and then some. Do you think that's really kind of expanded that and made it a lot easier for you? I mean, easy is a hard word in this industry. <laughs> it is a relative term. Yeah, I mean, it's relative. Like, but but I, I'll say to that point, I don't really, at this point, I don't really see any real challenges in tackling the business and growing it now. Uh, so I kind of look at how fast can I grow it and what do I think the, the end game is going to be? I'm not so concerned with where they are now. Um, I have a fundamental challenge of paying the, you know, these 15, 20 million dollar numbers for these businesses that really are absent, absent of management teams and systems. And the guys are, are playing that game. I don't typically play that game. Um, but at the end of the day, we look at it like, what can I turn that into and how fast and how much does that cost? Does, sure. it, does it matter to you what systems they're running? Like, I know you, you, you mentioned that, you know, you'll, you can implement your things. I mean, is it uh, a plus if they have X, Y, and Z, um, you know, platforms that they're using or they're using call rail for their calls or, I mean, does, does that stuff make a difference to you or? 
No, for me, all I'm really looking for is the team. You know, okay. do I believe I have a, a team that can rally behind my brand and my process and, and, and lead forward? And they want to be part of that. Um, you know, there's companies that, I won't mention any names, but there's companies that are entrenched in some of these best practice groups and they're using their those systems inside the business and what i see in that case and it's good and they're very well run businesses but the operators kind of they don't know the why behind the system they just so oh, no, point i do this it came out of the box and it's like and i'm gonna do this because i was and told it, to and do it this. works and the challenge i see with that is there's scalability issues because some of the systems limit the scale and then to have to change the human behavior to get them to think about things differently is very difficult and they're really stuck to that old system and it's very hard to get them come off say when they say well it sure worked before right you know so that's a challenge um and then you know there's the copyright issues and and uh, licensing right issues on some of these best practice groups and those proprietary systems that that if you somehow scale out too big and you know don't match in their uh, territory requirements and such. They can pull the systems and then you know, oh, it's yeah. like taking all the systems point. out of McDonald's store, right? And what are the people going to do? So I try to trying to solve that problem right now. But I try to stay away from the businesses that are really entrenched with a particular best pra practice group system because I don't believe it's sustainable. And you know. I won't you don't have, want to, but I really want to know. Stoke more, push more money <laughs> in that business when you know it's going to hit a wall. Sure. So, um, Billy, I want to kind of go back to you because you, you you got pulled back into the industry. Yeah, I did. You um, were retired for a few years. I did. I, I took a, a vacation. I was going to take a few months off and re reconsider what I was doing, but we had just gone through the. Uh, the downturn in the market and so i got pretty busy buying real estate kept myself busy that way and so the vacation turned out to be about five years but i, I came back and, and what drove me to come you know what was driving me to get back in the industry is i just felt like i had so much to share and i never really shared it before it was just all this stuff that i had and then i just didn't feel right unless i could give it to other people and that's how, kind of how sarah got started is it's, it's a it's a it's a, a partnership area is it's a business tool to help you run your business help you do the best practices from a to z and so from the very uh, minute the customer calls how we get customers in how we manage the customer success memberships things like that it's not just a digital filing cabinet like you have today it actually helps you run a better business and it's based on financial principles you know the way we price the way the price book works the way we go to market you know, we have a problem in this industry. You know, we can't find enough techs, right? That's what everyone says. But yet, we spend so much of our time overfilling our schedule board. And so we're just making the problem worse. And we help you think through that, like, what are the best calls to run? How to put the best people on them? And improve your margins and your, and your uh, profitability all the way through the financial statement by actually taking a look at each call and how to manage each call and what to do with it. And so that is really what we're there to do is, is, is give everybody a path to, to go down. Ken and I will tell you, I mean, we've, we've made lots of mistakes. I mean, hundreds and thousands of For mistakes. the record, I've never made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> You're on your own, Billy. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like a mistake to me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I always tell people, so I made all the mistakes for you. So get this software yeah. and let me help you just go and fix what you're doing because the, the reality is no matter what software you use or what shiny objects you buy if you don't have the basic principles of running a very uh, productive financially culturally and in and, um, and a place where the customer wants to come and do business with you i mean without those ingredients you're never going to really get to the next level yeah the the myth here is anytime i see a company that's let's say three million they always say, if I could get to $5 million, everything would be fine. Well, that's just like, well, if I could hire that one tech, I'd get out of the truck. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's always that mindset where it's like, well, I just need one more of this. Right. And so, um, <laughs> he's like, uh, I'm going to say something about that. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so Gallup Poll did, did um, they did research on our industry and said we're 38% efficient 
And so 62% of the time we're paying techs in the field, salesmen in the field, all these people out in the field, but 62% of the time they're not making us any money. And so what we really do at Sarah is we teach you how to be 100% efficient. So if you can't find enough techs and they're 38% efficient, why don't we just double your tech count without actually adding bodies when we get it to 76% efficient? Oh, I like that. that. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, it's, just, like, it's that, like you got to find on that, don't you? Yeah. Right. So there's so much room to improve the people you have. Why don't we do that instead of always saying we need more tech? Let's make maximize what we have now with good processes, software that can track it every minute of everyone's time, job cost jobs like you've never seen before. As soon as the job's done, you know what your efficiency level is. And these are the things that really bring in the cash for you. And so instead of trying to run more calls and trying to find more guys, why don't we maximize the guys we have? So if we're starting at 38%, we can double that efficiency at 76. We almost three exit at 100%, right? So that is the, the, cool, the, the cool thing about what we did at Sarah is helping you to maximize everyone that works in the business. You know, it just occurred to me, so in air conditioning for, for us air conditioning nerds, so your point about we just want to keep adding more tax to make more money, right, and not considering the efficiency, it's like airflow. You know, the, 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 bigger unit then. the more velocity you try to push through a duct, the losses grow exponentially, right? It's right. the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. By the way, on our live stream, um, Brian Bohannon gave us a shout out, Josh, you and I. He, uh, he said, uh, two legends. I think he talked about that. <laughs> well, I know he wasn't talking about these guys. <laughs> right? No, we appreciate everybody hanging out with us on live stream. But I got to tell you, like, you know, what, what Billy's pulled together now, I'm not a sports guy, but I'm around a lot of sports guys, and they know, well, this – this football team runs the zero four defense. Is that because you're a Raiders fan? I just have a I just have a sweet oh, okay. there. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, you know they you know they know the different the, the different uh, models right the different offenses and yeah. defenses and I'm that guy in HVAC and plumbing service company business models right. And, and I can tell you the frailties of each of the business models and where you're going to hit the wall here, where you're going to hit the wall here, you know, you know, what's your opportunity to improve on this one and that one. But I got to tell you, you know, what, how Billy has packaged the software. I think he's got the real business model inside the software. Yeah. And this is the first time, you know, we've been, I've floated around every software in the industry at one point. It's the first time where I really see this is the playbook, the business system. And if you can just discipline yourself to read the instructions and, and <laughs> do it like the instructions say, you're going to have a nice, clean, scalable business that can be ran by some pretty good average people. You don't need the superstars. I mean, I spent so many years, you know, really touting that you know, you got to get the talent, and I'm the right. talent expert, and you get all these high paid price guys, and you know, a plus a team, yeah, and and, uh, and try to get the best talent right. you can. Obviously. But really, if you want a sustainable business model, is having average people do extraordinary things, and I think that's what really he's come up with a total business system. And I wish I would have had it 30 years ago because I would have owned this entire country. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's really cool to hear so i mean are so what i'm hearing that that you believe in the sarah product and i mean is that something that you use no we we're a titan we're a service titan early adopter and and uh you know at this scale and, the, and what we're doing is the right solution for us at our size now but if i was getting started and really you know, there's a learning curve that happens for most of us in the industry because we come from the sales side or we come from the um, uh, technician side or, you know, we inherit the family business. And so there's a learning curve to really understand how the thing works, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And, you know, one of the reasons... We're great why, technicians, but we might not be business guys. I think one of the reasons why Billy and I and other guys kind of give back and help the younger guys is because we still have PTSD from those first 10 years <laughs> of trying to 
figure out a business system that we had no access to any tools with. I mean, we didn't have the internet or anything else. Yeah. And you didn't so, have chat GPT telling you how to do everything. Right. Yeah, by the way, let me say this. <laughs> For all you younger guys who are listening to this, you have zero excuse. No excuse. You know, we're playing with sticks and rocks trying to figure this thing out, abacuses, and, and you know, make it up as we go. <laughs> and you have every single tool, business tool, at your disposal by Googling it. Yeah. And access to talent and access to uh, all the best practices. There is no excuse. Every one of you should 5X whatever we've ever built in our whole careers That's with the point. resources that you have. That's a really good point. So as we wrap up here, is there anything, last thing that you want to ask, Josh? No, I guess for me, it's, you know, technology, the more that it gets created, the faster it gets created. It, it never slows down. Like the next great thing and the next great thing, it just keeps speeding up. What do you guys see? Because you obviously have access to a lot of data and a lot of information and obviously some people that might know some things. Bill, you're in the software world. What do you guys each see the future for software and how it's going to help home service companies? All right. Well, what I see is we're just in the beginning. I, I think we're in a renaissance right now. And and so the software that we build is next generation technology, right? It's not the same old .NET or whatever that was built in the, from the 90s, late 80s, 90s. This is technology that it can, it can actually learn and get better and, and give you information that you need so that you can run your business more efficiently. efficiently. And so... I think that is the beginning of you know the next generation of what we need to get done here. And as we progress with our product, uh, I think we'll be at the forefront of what we're, what's going on. We, we definitely have the roadmap. We've experienced it, you know, from the stone ages, as Ken puts it, you know. And so we know all the pitfalls. And so we really help companies get out of that day-to-day uh, -day grind that they're in. You know, the hair on fire that everybody has every day. Yeah, I don't and, have that problem anymore. And, I don't yeah, have anymore yeah, here, right? <laughs> and we just calm the businesses down. That's really what we do. And we find that the businesses that have been running the longest are the most complicated ones. And just little bitty steps, you know, that 5% rule I talk about every Saturday. Yep. Um, you know, if we could just change little things, 5%, um, it adds up to really big things really quickly. I always say, if you want to tell my manager, I said, the best businesses are the boring businesses where it's not a lot of hoopla and you know, high five and going on in the office is just really calm and chill. And they're like, oh yeah, we did 250,000 today. <laughs> you know, those yeah. are the best businesses because they're just running the playbook every single day. That's a good point. That is a very good point. They're I don't know where, where the whole technology thing that go, is going. It scares me to a certain extent, you know, because how did we, how did we get to the place where the Terminator movie is, is more real than ever? Yeah. Right. How did that know, it feels like it does. Yeah. But right now, it's good right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool, guys. We appreciate you coming and hanging out with us. I mean, truly, from the bottom of our heart. Uh, and everybody that's, that's watching live stream, we appreciate y'all hanging out with us. And, and I know they, they were asking a lot of questions, and I couldn't really get it all of them in there, uh, except for our legend comment. Uh, <laughs> you didn't miss that one. Yeah, I appreciate that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that being said, uh, I hope everybody has a, has a wonderful day. And, and thank you again, guys, for, for hanging out with us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. thank you.